and now it is being recorded. Yes. Okay. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? No? Okay, hearing on. Um, uh, we'll take citizen comments. Uh, as usual, with time permitting, we'll have citizen comments for most of the meeting. If your comments relate to the Business Relief Fund, Woodstock Works, the grant request from Community Classroom, or competitive bidding requirements, those are already on the agenda. Please hold your comments until we come to that. If you have a comment about anything else, now would be is the time for anyone who's not on the EDC, or, or I guess anyone on the EDC too, to make a comment. Are there any? If you can just, uh, of course, the chat box has disappeared. Um, I can't get it back until, oh, there it is. Okay, I see. I'm really having a bad Zoom day here. Uh, so you could, you could raise your hand um, or wave at me. Anybody have anything? Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, so I'm just reconfiguring my screen. Okay, then let's move on to approval of the minutes uh, from July 2nd. Are there any comments on the minutes or any discussion? If not, could I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Larry moved, Joe is seconding, and Michael is thirding. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, just for the record, if, if we're unanimous, we don't need to take a roll call, which we don't have to be. It's easy to take a roll call, but that was unanimous. Okay, a financial update. Um, Sally, uh, could you give us a, you were in the process of trying to reconcile, you know, our past records and also you may have, I don't know if you have any um, uh, new news about a forthcoming revenue or revenue that we've recently received. I haven't, I haven't checked. Is there any, any update uh, that you have? No updates on, on revenues for this quarter. Um, in terms of trying to get up-to-date information from the town, it's been very difficult to get accurate information from them. I'm trying to get the balances in all the accounts to see if they um, line up with what I actually have been reporting to you guys every month. Um, it's, it's like pulling teeth. I, I get little bits and pieces. So I'm still working on that. We'd like to close out some of these accounts, but I'd like to know what the balances are before we do okay. that. And Bill is on, maybe we can take that offline, but Bill is Karen. Um, and, and so Bill, we'll, we'll come back to you. We don't, we don't need to try to resolve it on this meeting, okay. but we'll come back to you. And I know that Sally and Zoe have been talking and, and but let's see you know, if we can resolve that. Well, one sure, thing, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, um, Julia, welcome. So, uh, okay, any, uh, so that's any other questions or, or Sally, anything about uh, anything else about the finances? We're sort of, I mean, we're sort of on financial hold until we start to see what pattern of revenue we're going to have. So it's going to be another three or six months, I think, before we start to have real financial discussions again, would be my guess. Yep. And I mean, basically, the financial statement has been included um, in the reports, yep. and you can see that there has not been significant changes to anything right. at this point. Okay. okay. Um, next, Sally, you can just stay on for a minute. Update on the Business Relief Fund, and then I'll right. give an update on what's up work. So um, the, the Business Relief Fund is also sort of not, not much action there. We actually made one additional award, uh, somebody who had a second request in July, and a third award was repaid. So the balance actually remains the same. It's $54,200. Um, again, the town accountant has not provided the name of the third business who gave back their money. So. Um, I have asked for that several times. Hopefully, I'll get it sometime soon. Okay. Well, at least, uh, right. So, we have three. Uh, so, 54, three is amount, yep. 54 is the amount remaining. Yep. Right. Uh, while we're on this, uh, uh, we've had a discussion at almost every meeting in the past about whether we should take any action on the business fund. Not taking action means we leave it as is. It's available. D does anyone want to make a motion or have a discussion about taking action, or should we leave it? Uh, and absent, I, I'm, 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 I suppose I'm tilting the equation a little bit by saying absent any proposal, we'll leave it as is. My guess is most people are comfortable. Yeah, I see everyone nodding, so. Okay. Um, Woodstock Works, just a quick update on Woodstock Works. That, that Woodstock Works is the gift card website. It has sort of gone a bit dormant. We haven't marketed it. 
we have, uh, per the brainstorming that took place either at an EBC meeting, I can't remember, Beth, or, um, uh, or I don't see Ray on, um, but we had, we had uh, some brainstorming to expand it to not-for-profits and to allow people to buy a gift card and donate it to a not-for-profit. So in other words, instead of the Prince and the Pauper having to donate uh, you know, a dinner to the, t the senior center, which they are asked to do at every senior center event and all the other events, instead of that, um, Julia, you can now buy a gift card for Prince and the Pauper and by pushing a button, send it over to the Thompson Senior Center, uh, you get the tax deduction, the Prince and the Pauper gets the meal and the Senior Center gets the donation. And uh, sort of it's a win for everybody. So that's in the works. And most of the programming has been done for that. When that is ready, uh, we'll probably sort of have a, a new relaunch of Woodstock Works. And we've also got some signs designed that we hope merchants will put, who are part of it, may want to put up to, that, that has a, a, what's it called, a Q code or, you know, the little, the, 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 the square rectangle code thing that you put your, put your phone on and it takes you automatically to the site. What is that called? QR. QR, QR code. Yeah, fine. Um, so that's the update on Woodstock Works. Any questions on the Business Relief Fund or Woodstock Works? No? Okay. Moving along then. So we have two main items for discussion. Um, the first is a grant request from, is it Community Classroom? Is that the proper name for it? Community Campus. Community Campus. Sorry, that's my mistake. Um, so Community Campus. And I think Tesha has sent in a proposal and and uh, I don't see Tesha. I know she's here. Oh, there you are. Sorry, you're in the upper right for me. Okay. So um, why don't you uh, take a few minutes to describe the proposal to us, and then we'll uh, the members of the EDC will ask questions. If if um, others want to ask questions, just give EDC members a chance to ask questions first, and then others can comment or ask questions as well. So go ahead, Tesha. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this. Community Campus was launched out of the need for helping working families and children with a lot of social and emotional needs uh, to be able to work within this hybrid learning that the district has put out. So for those of you that don't have children, uh, the district is uh, from K through second grade, you go to school four days a week and you do not go to school Wednesdays. The school day is shortened from to 8.45 a.m. to 2.50 with no after-school programming available through the district. If you are in third grade and older, you only go to school two days a week, either Tuesday, Thursday, or excuse me, Monday, Thursday, or Tuesday, Friday. Again, 8.45 to 2.50, no after-school programming. While many groups are launching uh, to try to find private tutors for themselves, we thought we're really going to leave a huge sector of the population that cannot afford private tutors, no ability to have their children cared for, coached on distance learning, and their parents are going to have to stop working or one of the parents will have to stop working to stay home to distance learn with their child. So we thought if we can consolidate resources, license a childcare facility, then we can, with that regulation, enable the lower income families to receive state subsidy, which is typically up to about 75%. Also be able to utilize state funds that will be coming online um, to help childcare centers deal with COVID which is another opportunity for us to potentially pass that along to, uh, to offset tuition. And then we worked with uh, the Woodstock Area Relief Fund for those folks that may not qualify for subsidy, but are struggling due to financial uh, you know, issues around COVID. So we're licensing these upper spaces at Rainbow Play School. Uh, we do have a little bit of experience because I did help with the licensing process when we moved into the new facility and that also is helpful for licensing. We will be able to accommodate 45 students in three of our spaces on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. It will be 35, 45 students two of those days, the other 45 students the other two days. On Wednesdays, we will accommodate just one group out of the two and then also additionally provide 
in our music and movement room, just one day programming for the K through second graders. We will be able to also then continue our services past, we're doing our services from eight to three. We'll be able to extend from three to five to offer after school programming on the days that folks distance learning through the community campus. And then we're working to license a second space. I have been um, visiting spaces and trying to, to determine which ones will be the quickest for licensing um, to be able to uh, you know, go for it, essentially, uh, knowing uh, what's in front of us with that. So that is uh, a total of 115 students that will able to be uh, distance learning with learning coaches that are uh, essentially guiding the students through the online curriculum from the district. So we're not a, we're not a school. We're really childcare helping kids distance learn. Okay, thank you. All right, um, EDC members first. Questions or comments about the proposal? Michael, first. Um, Tish, what, what's the age range of the, of the kids that you will be um, helping? K through six. K through six. Um, the state subsidy ends at age 13 for one, so we knew that we could help financially the most families if we focused on the lower uh, ages. And also, by the time you get to seventh grade, you might be able to stay home by yourself and your parent may not have to, you know, stay home from work to help you. But the idea is then to have kids come into Rainbow, to the facility on the days that they're not going to school. That's correct. That's correct? Yes. And then not, is it, in it, and also is it, in addition to that, to come after school on the days where they have school when there's no after school programming? Or is it a combination of those things? Well, we have to work out with the district. We have questions out to them about will a bus be able to drop kids off at Rainbow? Um, and then also the question of do then we only receive the enrollees in our, in our two option program. So we don't wanna, we're already cross pollinating germ pools. So the question becomes, you know, if you're already a community campus enrollee and you're going to school on Tuesday, but it's Monday, I, I mean, I'm sorry, you, you're enrolled at the community campus on Monday, but on Tuesday, you just need the after school care. We're trying to get those kids cared for um, as long as there's enough space in our program to accommodate both, and that might be on a first come first serve basis for who can um, enroll in the after school program if the, if the district allows for a school bus drop off. Right, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions from ABC folks? Joe? Oh no, oh, Joe, sorry. Joe, you're muted. Joe, you're muted. Uh, Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can, yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned licensing a couple of times. Is extra licensing going to be required? Or can, can you kind of enlighten me a little bit about what the licensing involves? Yes, so we have to submit all of our financial documents, Secretary of State, uh, federal identification number. That is, cool. that, is that what you're saying? I'm sorry, you cut out. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the school will need uh, licensing to, to uh, provide this program, is that correct? That's correct. Um, it ensures that we follow all of the procedures uh, to ensure kids' safety. So aside from business documents, we also have to submit emergency preparedness plans, parent handbooks. Uh, we need to show that all of our teachers enter in through a the Building Bright Futures uh, account, which means that they're background checked, they are fingerprinted, they know how to administer um, medications should they need to, they have, C it's uh, mandated that they have CPR training, and the state needs to make sure that they review all of those. And then that, uh, there's not a huge educational requirement for school age children, but it's more so that they wanna make sure that these people are safe and that the, that the community campus has thought about how to move kids should there need to be an emergency evacuation and, and school drills and how often that they will be and, um, 
And then on top of that, they regulate COVID procedures. So there's a large document um, additionally, uh, in addition to the 86 pages of regulations um, on how to handle COVID check-ins and check-outs and what can be brought into school and what cannot. They also do state where hand washing sinks are and, and, and bathrooms proximity and such like that. Sure. Uh, the COVID thing, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I was curious about will it be testing involved with the with the young kids uh, or not or uh, that but I I'm assuming since you did mention it that that'll be a separate type of test um, training requirement uh, that that'll be part of the licensing thing is that is that am I understanding that correctly um, they don't have a training that you necessarily have to sign a certificate except for the VOSHA training, which is reading about a 50 some page document and making it and then you uh, certify that you met that requirement. The rest of it is explaining uh, procedures and then it says a lot of times it says this is what we recommend we understand there's going to be times like for instance at Rainbow Play School they want us to be six feet but there's going to be a one-year-old that falls face down and is going to need to be picked up so after you pick up that child that teacher needs to care for themselves and wash their own hands and then we wash the child um, mm -hmm. and so on and so on so it's basically um, a large regulation for and it's a training for us so that we're not making this up or just following you know cdc it's very specific to children thank you you're welcome Um, sorry, I was muted. Larry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, f uh, first of all, I want to really compliment you for this. This is a crying need, and um, I'm delighted that someone with your ability and um, obvious uh, caring for this is, is um, spearheading it. It's a, it's a, a really, I, as a member of the community, I'm really appreciative of that. Um, I, in reading through um, with my EDC hat on, um, I was um, interested that you're going to be hiring from 10 to 17 new people. Is that correct? Yes, 50% uh, of them um, full time and the rest uh, part time. And, and you also, do you foresee, I, I'm hearing something in the background, do you foresee this is going to enable people to go back to work who could not otherwise given the new school um, uh, time frame? That is our understanding. Um, so I've been in contact uh, regularly with Sherry Sousa, who's been fielding a lot of concerns from the parent body of all the children and parents that you know are a part of the district. And that is certainly the biggest concern is, what am I going to do? For instance, I was standing at Rainbow Place School. Um, I've been there regularly. Our new program director just started, so I was assisting the transition. And when it came in from the district, all of the parents that have kids in the school system, we all looked at each other and went, how are we gonna take care of our kids and teach at the same time? If we don't do something, our school is gonna be shut down and, or at least three of our classrooms will be shut down. Our entire preschool program will be gone. Um, we only have one teacher that's qualified for, to teach public pre-K and she's got two children. So that was also a huge motivating factor uh, that, that began this. And so what we're hearing from the district is that many other families are in a similar situation. And they just, the school district just approved a community solutions group, which we're in collaboration with uh, for being one of the options that's out there. We certainly are the option at present that serves the greatest number of children. Um, so we are certainly hoping, we, we haven't gone extremely public with this because we're it's like a centrifuge we're just kind of going around the circle doing all sorts of things at the same time because we don't have the luxury of if this then that then if this then that and moving forward the way that you would normally start an organization so it's definitely um i'm very humbled by the experience and understand that we have a, a we have a lot to get through but we do have a lot of ducks in a row we have teachers that are already applying um, our new education director is christiana plas who runs the after school program typically obviously she doesn't have a job with the district so um, sherry susa has encouraged her to join with uh, the community solutions group and then um, 
and then when, with her off hours join with us that puts us in huge contact with somebody who regularly communicates with parents and is regularly communicating with a body of teachers that have the same requirements for education that we do at the community campus and do you have a particular you're asking for twenty five thousand dollars do you have a particular um, use for that those funds Yes, I submitted a budget. I don't know if it um, came to you and I don't know if I can view it now and lose Zoom. So I'm gonna pull this from memory. I mean, some of it is just classroom materials such as tables that fold up so that we can utilize a classroom sitting down, but kids are not gonna sit at that desk all day like the third graders, for instance. I mean, so, so tables, chairs, um, we do have to have the use of some portable sinks uh, in lieu of way more expensive plumbing to locations that weren't ever planned on for classroom spaces. Um, a little bit of outdoor uh, playground material that we don't have currently. Um, for me, one of the most important things is a one week training salary. We feel that we can cover one week it with, you know, 75% enrollment, but we have to train these people for, um, for the COVID regulations to make sure that we're safe, but also to communicate with teachers from the district so that the coaches know a little bit better what they're doing. As a parent, I sat with my kindergartner. There were times that I didn't even understand what the question was. So I have a feeling that um, with that extra assistance, we're gonna be able to provide much stronger assistance to these children and then also be able to learn how to do some interaction safely with them that is off of the ipad and disconnected from um potentially like district led but um but we're doing it away from a device okay uh, uh any other edc members have questions or comments I'd like to comment, John. I don't have any questions because in full transparency, I've been supporting this initiative as part of the project planning team. So I've been um, part of, of the shaping and the design and helping um, Tisha and the other uh, teachers that have been providing uh, support to her to really kind of reach out across the community and pull some of these partnerships together and I really strongly believe that the community campus is economic development in the sense that without our workforce, without our families being able to go to school and feeling confident they have, that they have quality choices around childcare, um, we don't have an economy. And so, um, you know, as we watch this pandemic stress the school system and the workforce and our families, it's, um, it's been just really a, a powerful experience to be brought along by Tisha and the community campus to be able to provide such a compelling solution um, to keep families working, to keep businesses opening, to keep money circulating in our economy, and then to be just really um, supporting these kids with uh, a real enriching and safe educational experience that allows them to kind of be in a consistent schedule um, with familiar faces um, and being guided by, um, you know, the vision and the support system that the community campus can offer. Um, and I also think that, you know, this is of course a one-time ask just to increase capacity, but the, the model itself is really solid. And I think that it can really stand up as a viable business model beyond the pandemic. So, um, you know, we could have a long, uh, a long visioning session about what this model becomes post COVID, but I think it, it really provides, um, you know, some investment in the education sector. Uh, it's potentially a pipeline for workforce development for um, really uh, coaching up new teachers for the area. Um, and it just for new families who may be considering locating here, it provides yet another really attractive option um, and, and, and more choice. And we know that that's what people want. They want choice, they want options, um, and they want um, you know, it to be really, to, to feel sort of branded to Vermont and to the area, which I think the sort of the ethos and the space really 
um, fits within all of that. So I'm really proud to have been part of this planning process and, and also um, to, you know, to feel like we're really providing um, some very needed assistance that aligns really well with the EDC's um, goals. I, I could not agree more. I just wanted to um, second everything that Elizabeth said, except for the being involved part, because I, <laughs> I have not. But um, I also, I was, before, the point that I was going to make was the point that you just made about new families moving to town. I think we're at an inflection point of Woodstock's um, appeal and population to new families who have spent some time in the area or who may be quarantined up here. Um, I've heard from real estate acquaintances that um, people are considering putting their kids in, in school here for a short-term period of time. Um, those are people who could decide to be here for one year or for five years or for 20 years. So um, a community that takes its kids seriously and it, it's the parent's ability to work seriously um, is huge. I think this also will have um, an impact on uh, inequality um, in terms of, you know, I certainly want to send my kids to a school where the um, children are not strided or tracked based on income or access to tutors. Um, so this is a huge um, boon. Okay, great. Any other comments or questions from EDC members? I have one, a couple, one or two. Most of them have been answered, but uh, well, if you do, and then I'll ask if there's anyone else who has any comments or questions. Um, Tesha, uh, what happens if, if, um, if the licenses are denied? Is, is the timing and sequence of this spending such that I know that uh, Elizabeth said that this money could be, this program or platform could be used more than just during a pandemic. And, and I can see that some of the things that you said, I mean, the temporary sinks, probably not, but the tables and the equipment and so forth, yes. So there's some expansion of capacity. But is there a way to time this so that if for some reason it doesn't work out, and obviously I hope it does work out, that we basically haven't, you know, that, that you wouldn't spend the funds because you wouldn't need them because the program wouldn't be operating? Or is that not, is everything happening all at once and it's just not possible to predict that? To the best of our ability, we, we will not spend money until we have as much security as possible. That's for sure. Um, I mean, I, I've been donating my time through this whole planning process, as well as Elizabeth and Kate Kardashian, who worked on um, much of the educational uh, basis for this and did a lot of the, the research based on how children, uh, most children regressed during this distance learning period. So what I've been doing is calling licensing almost every day to make sure that um, like the first phase, for instance, to license Rainbow Play School is all set to be sent. And I've gotten a very detailed list of everything um, that we need to complete for phase two. And I don't foresee, um, the only concern I have is that the school aged children will have to walk downstairs to go to the bathroom, but the licensor um, explained it with, A, they are school aged children, they can walk down the stairs, and then what type of signage that we can just uh, pre prepare in advance. Um, that was her only red flag for me. Um, you know, we have wastewater permits all uh, set, Act 250 is set for the building, for the number of people and the number of educators that we'll have in there. So there are no red flags that I see at the Rainbow location. Moving on to other locations, um, that's why I've been meeting with people uh, to make sure that, uh, that those spaces have the same check mark um, for, for everything. And, and the list is, you know, it's about 35 things that you have to have in place for licensing. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I, I trust that you'll, I don't think the EDC needs to get involved in the, in, you know, making sure that you're getting all the licenses, I'm sure you're going to. I guess what I would suggest that if we do approve this, that we, it's very important, particularly in a situation like this, I think, it's important to understand that all EDC grants are just for the purpose for which they were intended. It's not, here's $25,000, hopefully you'll use it for this, but if you don't, you can use it for something else. That's not how, that's, it's, we're not picking on you, that's not how any of our grants work. So we'll just have to, I just want to make it clear that, that, that you, you'll need to use the funds for what, you know, for what they were intended. And if what was intended doesn't happen and you haven't spent the funds, you need to give them back. So 
um, and that, again, that would be true for any grantee, not just, not just you. Um, and I, there's no impact. This does not reduce your capacity, your existing childcare capacity. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, the, the, the Rainbow Play School operates just on the first floor, okay. and this will be uh, on the second and third floors. Got it. Okay. All right, good. Any other any other questions from anybody, EDC members or anyone else who's on the call or comments? Kareem? Yes, hi. Um, thanks. Um, so, Tisha, I think we met through your presentation to uh, Worf. Yes. And um, I think the, the focus there was really driven by financing uh, the tuition for those families who wouldn't be able to actually afford it. So it's very specific in time, very specific as far as the usage. Kind of, you know, what you said, John, and and I believe I would add that even if that money would be spent, but it needs to be returned, it doesn't really matter. The money needs to be returned to the EDC, right? Um, <laughs> um, my, my question is, I, I think it would be helpful, um, that's my personal the recommendation, um, to, to have a little bit more flushed out what that organization can do uh, after COVID um, so that from an ROI point of view, we're looking at something that's going to be continuing in time. I think that that, that would be actually a great business case also for, for, that, for that organization. Uh, my question though is, let's say in a month or so, for whatever unfortunate reason, there's a lockdown. And the governor, you know, goes back to what happened in March, doesn't want people to leave home, doesn't want people to, you know, gather at all, etc. What, what happens then with uh, what you're putting together? Is, does this go dormant until you can reopen again? That's a great question. So what I can speak to is the history of what Rainbow Play School went through during the, the first lockdown. And the state specifically provided funding for early child care centers. And so it was a little bit of a complicated process that they streamlined by the end of it, but essentially we submit everything to the state that we would have submitted in invoices to our parents. And then the state through this complicated uh, you know, system then paid us those invoiced amounts to make sure that we, we would continue paying all of our teachers through that whole process. They moved to distance learning, which of course isn't ideal, but that's, you know, that was the only option that we were presented with. So we distance learned uh, with our children and we paid them in full and we received the state assistance. Now I have asked, will this be in place? Should there be another lockdown? And nobody can say absolutely yes, but everyone can say we, we still can't have child care it's just vanish because then we'll be at a, at a strong need um, when we return to life as we used to know it. Okay, now this is great because you're, you're, you're in a startup type of situation. So you're more vulnerable, I would say in a certain way. And you just wanna make sure that you have all the protections in place should this happen in a couple of months. And then, as I said, looking down the road, as Elizabeth and Julia said, that there's a lot of opportunities with such an organization, and it would be great to have those, you know, hone, honed in on. Um, I think John mentioned mentioned that too. Thank you. That's it, John. Okay. Thanks, Kareem. Sally. Uh, John, I just wanted to remind folks that our our grant process is a reimbursement program, so that um, folks don't actually get money until they have spent the money. So, um, and, and Tesh knows this because we did this previously for Rainbow. So they will submit um, invoices and then we pay that. So we don't actually give the money up front. Um, just yeah, no, no, sorry, I, I, I knew that, I, I, but I forgot it when I made the comment. But uh, my point is that if, if Tesh, I don't want Tesh's organization to think that, you know, they can use it to buy a camping site, you know, a camping equipment because they've decided to do camping because they don't want to do this. And would they please, and they go out and buy the camping equipment and submit the invoice for that. That's, we're not going to, yeah, you get it. So, so but thank you, Sally. It's, I, I misspoke substantively. <laughs> it was a mistake. All right, any other comments or questions for Tesha? Jeff? Yeah, I, I have a question. First of all, I, I agree that what you're doing is important for the community and, um, and the Woodstock uh, economic Commission, Economic Development Commission, uh, supporting that. Um, 
I think is important, but I also wonder if it would be possible for uh, that money over time to be uh, returned if, uh, through uh, your tuition raising uh, funds uh, with no interest rate over an extended period of time. Other, other monies sent out by the EDC have uh, some of them, including ones to the business community, have been uh, grants that uh, are meant to be returned after a period of time, uh, if possible. Uh, and I wonder if uh, that's been considered at all. There's certainly room. Um, in the budget that I presented, I took for purposes of, of example, I proposed, I did income charts at 100%. And then when I did our profit and loss, I did it at 75% enrollment. And then I took after school programming down to 50%. So I wanted to do that to be responsible. So there is room. If we, if we hit those numbers that are more than 75% enrollment during the day, then we should have that cushion. That being said, this is a new adventure. Uh, there are all sorts of things that definitely come up in that, that I will have forgotten about, I'm sure, even though I did take Rainbow's P&L as my uh, cross-reference point so that I could have uh, the expenses that early child care centers usually have. So hopefully we've done our due diligence and that there will be that space um, in that budget to grow so that we will have that profit to then give back. Thank you. So, so it's possible that over an extended period of time, say five years or something like that, uh, with no interest bearing, monies could be returned to the EDC. Sure, absolutely. See, I think, yeah, I, I think we have to decide as an EDC. We, we do have a loan program. We've, we've sort of um, not quite, with the exception of the Business Relief Fund, which we administer ourselves, we haven't... Um, we haven't really activated it, although we've tried with a couple of grantees. Um, the The process that you described, Tesha, in effect, makes the EDC funding the last resort. So basically, only if everything works out, you know, I mean, only if everything works out, would we get would 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 our loan get repaid? And and I can understand that it's hard to predict, but. Um, so when we come to in, in a moment, Jeff, I'll, I'll try to put some. I, I, I had the same thought that that um, maybe what we do is is give a twelve thousand five hundred dollar grant and a twelve thousand five hundred dollar loan, which would mean that you would need to repay us twenty five hundred dollars per year at the end of year one, two, three, four, and five. That seems like for an organization that's operating now at the scale that you will be operating at, it seems like not an unreasonable, you know, request. Um, and it would set a, a bit of a precedent, which I like what we did with the business relief fund, which is, you know, to, to basically say, if, if it's possible, we'd like to have this be a loan. So, um, so anyway, that's one way of, of structuring this that would kind of compromise and, 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 and not impose an undue financial burden on you, but follow the principle of repaying where, where feasible. Are there any other? Um... Well, I would like to just ask what, what I think I heard you say that there isn't a precedent for that yet. So why would we set one now? No, there is a precedent. Yeah. There, there is a precedence for it. We did it, we did it with the grant, a $30,000 grant to uh, the, the um, Woodstock Kitchen. What was, uh, I'm not getting the name right, where we granted them $15,000 and $15,000 of a loan. And they decided not to take the loan. Um, so they only took 15,000 mm -hmm. uh, and then we did it with the business relief fund in a slightly different way where we, you know, where, where we made that made the repayment of the full amount contingent on the financial viability of the organization one year down the road. I think either of those models are, are, are you know, are appropriate. Um, you know, and so the financial viability model, Tesha, would give you that flexibility, I suppose, to but let's have a quick discussion of this. It's if there are no more questions about the substance of the, of what the money is for, Joe. Oh, you're muted, Joe. I, uh, you know, I, I can understand both sides of the issue, uh, but I, I honestly feel that this program is 
a key probably ingredient and maybe a, a launching pad for, uh, as was stated earlier, for one more thing, one more issue why people would want to move here and stay here. And I think that is so important. And we have given money or granted money without any loan uh, requirement. This, I think, is so much more important to the community. Um, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it, it would require a grant and a loan only if, if the EDC doesn't have the money. If we don't, you know, that's one of the things that comes into my mind, you know, is the receipts coming in in the future are going to be minimal compared to what they have been. So if, if we are in the jam where we can't uh, grant money the way we used to, then yeah. But if we do have money, I think it's critical that we support this with a grant. That's my opinion. Okay, well, just to be clear, in terms of availability, we don't know what money is going to come in, but we do have right. the funds to pay for this. So it's not right. a you know, right. lack of funds. Does anyone right. else have a, have a pro of feeling on the EDC in favor of or, or, or opposed to the idea of combining, of having this be in some form of a loan? Yeah, I yeah. similarly. Oh, sorry. Oh, I think Julia, we're... and then I couldn't see, is that Elizabeth? Julia? Um, I was just going to say that I, I, I similarly feel the way that Joe does. Agree, um, I, yeah. I, yeah, I can't really see, I, I see the many economic and community benefits of this program. So I, I can't um, imagine a more uh, appropriate use of funds at this point in time. Okay. Elizabeth, was, were you the one? I think and it was Mika. Yeah. Oh, Mika. Mika here. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Party right. here. Go ahead, Mika. Um, and then last. I just wanted to second. Oh. That's why I was on you. Um, I wanted to second Joe. Uh, I second Joe. You okay, know. I think you're thirding him now, Larry. Uh, yeah, well, I'm. I'm also. Uh, but the other factor, it seems to me that this is a. This is something that's responsive to a current COVID crisis, and to, to, uh, to even suspect that yeah, it would be great if they are still uh, doing things five years from now. But you know, I think we're really talking about a very current. Uh, vibrant need that may or may not even exist five years from now. I, I don't see any. I don't. I don't. And it's a. It's a ex excellent use of our funds. I don't see yep. any any point in making it into a loan. Okay. All right. Seems pretty clear then. All right. Good. Are there any other questions about the program? Can I say one comment about the future of the program? Sure. Go ahead. We are in collaboration with the Strengthening Families Network. We are in collaboration with the National Park Service and Billings Farm, and uh, we're working hard to create these community relationships where we'll be able to use this as an experiment to see what the future of education could turn into. Uh, it could be that we rotate kids throughout this campus throughout the course of school weeks or months and whatnot to learn. We're, we're trying to investigate with farm and wilderness and chickens on our facilities. So it's gonna be a great training ground for what the educational uh, landscape could look like for our town, which will definitely bring people to this area. Okay, all right, good. Any other comments? Okay, so um, I, we're, we now, um, I don't know if this is because this is, co well, it's probably not going to matter because we have seven votes. I think we said we needed a two thirds vote of the EDC in order to have grants outside of the January cycle. This is a COVID emergency grant. So I don't know if that applies, but, it, but if it's unanimous, then it won't matter. So um, all those in favor of this grant, let's just visually, you, if you're on, yeah, Mika's now on, okay. With a thumbs up or, or raise your hand. Wait, John, John. I'm sorry, Sally, go ahead. Uh, could you actually make a motion? Yeah, oh, fine. So I, I, I will make a motion then. I'll move that the EDC grant uh, a community campus $25,000 to implement the program that was in their proposal and that Tesha described tonight. Second. Second. Who seconded that? Joe did. Okay, yeah. all, in, all in favor, show by raising your hand. Okay, it's unanimous. And let the record show that Mika has joined as well. So there's all of us except Courtney are here and have voted positively. 
Okay. Uh, no opposed. There's no other votes left. So great. Congratulations, Tesha. Could, um, could you? Could we? Um, it is in in. Uh, it's supposed to be in all of the EDC grants that from a publicity point of view, the EDC is given credit for its participation in a project. This particularly, I think, would actually benefit Woodstock, not really the EDC, I mean, EDC maybe, but it would really benefit Woodstock to promote ourselves as a place that is doing something, whoever paid for it, it doesn't really matter who pays for it, is doing something in a very creative and proactive way. So I would ask that you and your team devote a small amount of resources to um, to making sure that that the word gets out that Woodstock is doing this, not in a way that you know is designed to increase your registration, but something broader than that that is designed to promote Woodstock's um, approach to this this situation. To go back to Julia's point, that it's a community that, at least in this case, is demonstrating that it cares about education and. Uh, you know, and, and I think it's something really positive. And so if there's anyone, anyone here, Beth, perhaps you or, or anyone else in this group who, um, who might be able to help community campus with that effort, I'm not particularly a PR person, but um, let's just keep that in mind and, and, and try to figure out a way over the next couple of months that we can do something with that. So congratulations, a very exciting program. Thank you okay. for your support. All right, we have one more, we have one more item on the agenda. Um, um, because the only thing that would keep me from having summarized this discussion on a chart was that we had a last minute tennis match with Woodstock versus Queechee, which happened right before this. And I'm sweating and wearing my tennis clothes. So I did not have a chance to summarize this, but let me, Larry, I'm gonna, and Larry, in a minute, I'm gonna ask you, I'll give you 20 seconds to get ready. I'm just gonna ask you to summarize the current policy. In order, you know, in, in our sort of slow, but steady way of codifying as much as we can for EDC operations so that we can explain to people why we make decisions. Um, w w uh, the question of, of competitive bidding has come up. It's come up in the past about a year ago or 15 months ago when we decided as a committee that we wanted to have competitive bids for a part of Teagle's Landing or maybe it was for the trash cans, I can't remember, or the benches, whatever it was. Um, Larry has done some investigation and has discovered that the town has a competitive bidding policy, which the EDC for our own projects, we believe, is required to follow as we are a government organization. So if there's an EDC project where the EDC is spending its own funds, we need to follow that competitive bidding policy. And Larry, maybe you can just, now th that sounds more onerous than it is because the policy is in fact, and it's a, I guess it's a town and a village joint policy. Uh, th the policy in fact allows for quite a bit of discretion and flexibility where needed. So it's, it really is, is more of a reminder to make sure we're spending money properly rather than a set of handcuffs that constrain wise ways of doing business. So I think it's a good policy and, and one that isn't too bureaucratic. But maybe, and we, we believe that, that the EDC needs to follow that policy. That's not what we want to discuss tonight. What we want to discuss is whether or not, or to what extent, we would want to have grantees follow that policy because it's taxpayer funds that are flowing through to them. And what I'd like to do is, Larry, if you could just very briefly summarize what the policy is for government, for government projects, whether it's the town, the select board project or ours. And then I'll frame the question, which we're not gonna to decide tonight, we just want some strategic direction as to which direction to go in. And then we'll do some more work and come back at the next meeting with an actual proposal. So Larry, do you mind, would you just briefly summarize the policy? And Bill or Mary, if you, or Jeff, if you have any disagreement with this, but I, I suspect Jeff, I mean, Larry, well, anyway, go ahead, Larry. Um, okay, well, this is, this is directly out of the purchasing policy that the uh, town and village uh, passed in 2013. Um, and all I've done is call out the portions that um, are specific to the town and village um, uh, in terms of process. Um, 
there, there's been a lot of question as to what the, the minimum is and how you do it and whatever. But the policy itself says that the, the contracts over $3,000 are subject to this policy, specifically subject to this policy. I know that some in some discussions, there's there's thought that it might be five thousand um, dollars. I uh, Mary Riley's tried really hard to find out if that's the case. Um, nobody seems to know for sure. But it, so we're dealing with three thousand dollars, and soliciting bids is you. There are um, pretty easy methods. One, you can mail an, a letter to all the known providers and ask them to respond to it. Just a, a letter. You can place an, an advertisement in a newspaper, and that's expensive and time consuming, but you can do that. Or you can just post a bid solicitation on the town of Woodstock's website. Very, it, it, it's really quite simple. Um, and the bid, the bid specifications, what we call a, a request for proposal RFP or whatever, are the normal specifications. But you know, also don't even have to do that. You can invite people to a site visit and explain to them orally what you want to do, and that if that's enough to 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 meet the uh, the town's um, uh, requirements, then um, there's some there's some uh, sp um, specifics on what the bid should be um, um, uh, contained. But then it says that. Um, we reserve the right and their sole discretion to reject any and all bids wholly in part and waive any informalities or ir irregularities. Basically, if you screw up, um, you know, as long as you sort of go with the spirit of it, there's, there's not a problem. And it's not even a requirement that you receive more than one bid. One bid is, one bid is fine. So, um, and also the, um, uh, in this case, it would be the EDC, um, and determine that a particular contractor, service provider, or whatever is superior to all its competitors and not even put it out the bid. Um, and if it's a professional service, which they say is something that's characterized by a high degree of professionalism, you don't have to go out for bid. So that, that's, that's that current policy. And it's pretty, pretty uh, lenient, pretty uh, loose, but its intent is to make sure that the public knows that there's been at least some attempt to get the, the best price and with the best contractor. Right. So we, 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 again, we're not making any decisions tonight. We can confirm this, but we believe, Larry and I believe that there's not really any debate that EDC led projects where we are voting, the select board approves our project. We give ourselves the money. Teagle's Landing is a good example. The benches is another example where we are the executing party you know, it's just like the town hall, the select board is spending the money. We are government, we are acting as government agents, direct employees in effect or volunteers, but, and that we have to follow that policy. And again, it gives us the flexibility to operate the way we would need to and, and use and spend the money wisely. But we have, so we're not debating whether or not we have to follow the policy. And at the next meeting, we'll just make sure that everyone understands the policy in detail and that it's being applied to our project. The question has been raised as to whether or not, because it's taxpayer funds, whether or not we want to put any sort of requirement on grantees. And so what I'd just like to do tonight is just solicit, maybe I'll just kind of go around to the EDC members and just solicit, give us some direction along the following dimensions so that Larry and I can work on a specific proposal to take them to the select board. And that direction might be at one extreme, we believe grantees should follow the process. Now they have the flexibility, but we want them to follow the process as if they were, because it, because it's taxpayer dollars, as if it were, you know, a government, as if, as the way we would have to, or the select board would have. At the other end of the spectrum would be, we are silent. Somewhere in the middle would be to explain the principles of sort of trying to, you know, get competitive bids where possible, but also trying to pick the best, you know, to, to spend the money wisely, recognizing that it's a taxpayer expense and to kind of come up with some words that are, that, that encourage grantees to think about the issue and know that we're sensitive to it, but not require them to follow the policy per se. So do nothing, follow the policy, guidance sort of in the middle. Let me, I'll start with Joe because he's waving, he's giving me the finger. And ah. <laughs> and so if you can just, the question for each of you is where do you think on that spectrum we ought to be? 
we, that doesn't mean anything. We won't, that's not a decision. We'll just develop language for that place on the spectrum and come back to you next month and say, what, what should our policy be? Joe, go ahead. Well, the thought comes to mind that uh, the select board developed this, the existing policy in 2013. And I'm sure they did that with some probably extensive discussion. Um, so essentially what you're doing or what you're asking us to do is to ask them to change that decision that they made in 2013. That's what it sounds like they're asking us to do. No, no, let me clarify that. that no, no. Correct? no, no, that's not correct. The, 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 we are, the, the, po the policy that they wrote does not apply to grantees, as I read it. We, can, we, can, we will ask the select board whether they intended it to, if they say absolutely it applies to grantees, then then we have our answer. The grantees must must follow it. I mean, unless we would like to raise with the select board a, a desire to change it, which which is not we're not this is not coming from a place of we want to change something. It's coming from a place of we want clarity as to what 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 should be done because there's been some discussions that are sort of loose about are we supposed to follow this or not and is it three thousand or five thousand and what are we supposed to do so we're just trying to see clarity so i would say joe that unless the select board intended this policy to be to apply to grantees and mary maybe you can comment briefly if you remember whether it was intended for that i don't my well, reason, the word we're grant, not asking them to change anything the word grantees is not in this and what and what they propose. Correct? It is it is not. Okay. So so we're just they, asking were, were there no grantees I, I I'm gonna just trying to understand why why we want them to go over this again. We, we, we don't. We're just we're, we're 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 trying to figure out uh, uh, do we need to have do we need to tell grantees? Yeah that they that anything about how they spend their money yeah since we have to comply with ways to spend their money and one possibility yeah. is we don't have to say anything to them right that's that's well, the, you know, to, to be clear i i think we we should the responsible thing to do is to ask them that the grant you know for uh, a competitive bid i mean that's my position but it's as it's written the word grantees is not in there. Yeah. And maybe there was a reason for that. Okay, but, but, but from our, okay, from our point of view, um, uh, then you're saying that you would, you would argue that we should ask people to, you know, unless the, unless the select board convinces us otherwise, we should yeah. develop some language to require them. Okay, Elizabeth. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I agree with Joe. I think this is extremely important and I think um, you know, I think the more transparency that we can have in our local government, the better. Um, and if the EDC could take sort of a leadership role in, in, in being able to sort of pass that transparency through its grantees, I think that would be important. Um, for me, the question would be to sort of run, um, run that policy across a couple different grantees that maybe we've already given monies to to see you know what kind of burden this might potentially place on them so you know is it is there is there sort of an undue burden clause that might need to be put into that policy based on you know the the size or the size of the type of operation or the size of grant that's being given out um uh you know, would it be giving out a $25,000 grant versus a $10,000 grant? Do you need to do a competitive bid process on a $10,000 grant, for example? Okay. All right, good. Uh, any, anyone else have a point of view as to where on the spectrum we might want to be? Michael? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we should create this. It's too much micromanaging. I mean, we don't have time for this kind of thing. I mean, someone comes to us with a grant request, let them do what they know how to do. That's not our job. I mean, I, I think it's creating a huge burden for, for people. And I, and I think it's just gonna slow the process down of whatever project it is. Uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of it. I wonder okay. if the verbiage could be somewhere um, in between and 
create, I mean, part of what we do is we look at um, the applications that people have submitted. And if it appears as if they are um, slapdash or as if they have not sought bids or compared prices or something, um, we haven't granted them money. Um, but to the people who appear to be sincere in their efforts to, um, you know, use taxpayer dollars uh, responsibly, those tend to be the people that we um, give grants to, at least in my, that's been my impression of how um, some of our discussions have gone. So I guess just codifying that process um, and connecting it to the select board's intention might be one way to, um, you know, gesture at our understanding of what the select board intends uh, without placing an additional administrative burden on the EDC or um, the grantees. I'm in that category. So we now have different people on EDC advocating for each of the three options. So I think we're, which is fine. Is it someone who hasn't said anything, who hasn't jumped in here? I, I, I haven't. I haven't actually, um, but, but uh, I'm not sure if I understood what Julia just said, but my, my thought is that this is a question for the select board to ask them what they, um, what, what, tell them the situation. I mean, I agree with Joe, the policy as written does, talks about town employees and uh, it doesn't even, you know, by implications, the EDC. Uh, and so, and I think the EDC is always under, assumed perhaps that it applies. And then going further to grantees um, is, an, is another question of interpretation. And I think we, we want to be transparent and we want to do what the select board feels is the right thing to do. And I think we should go and lay this question out to them. I think there is a simple way uh, in, turn, in addressing Michael um, I think there's a simple way to uh, do this, which is to make part of the application uh, of a grantee that th their confirmation that they either went through a bidding process or determined that the contractor in question was the best contractor to do this particular type of work, or that it was a professional person and really isn't part of the bidding process. And all they have to do is just, it just be, is it one of these things? And they say yes or no, or, or something, write something short down. But why don't we just find out what the blackboard wants? Yeah, I would agree with Larry. Uh, all right, so I'm going to, Sally, and then I'm going to, Mika, I'm going to give you a chance. And then Mary, I might just call on you just to briefly comment. So Sally, go ahead. Sally, um, Mika. So I think, I think um, the, the, su the suggestion that um, Elizabeth had about looking at some of the grantees is really important because of that might make it clear as to what, how you want to proceed on this. I will say that the number of grants that I worked on that were actually for professional services, so the studies and other things like that, it's very difficult to you're not going to put all the time and effort into that grant by finding bids because it's very hard to find somebody to do a project when you don't know if you've got the money. So I'm just saying I would hesitate to make that a requirement of receiving the grant. You might say, yes, you need to get bids, and we always did that. But I, I think that it's very difficult to do it beforehand. So just be careful about that. But I'm willing to take a look at it and sort of look at the list. I mean, we have quite a few grants in there and um, see how many of them actually did get competitive bids without us even asking for it. Or, or, or how many of them decided that uh, XYZ professional person or contractor was the best person to do it and didn't go out for bids because of, based on that, which is sufficient to meet, as I read the policy, it's sufficient to right. meet. The, the, yeah. the, the, yeah. It is, it is fine, but I, I'm just saying that the, the ones that I know of that I worked on, we did go out and we sent letters to everybody and we did solicit proposals and had RFPs and things like that. So, right, right. And done Mika, without it being specified. Okay. Mika, did you want to say anything? You didn't raise your hand, but I just wanted to give um, you. Yeah, I, I am very much in favor of that exercise of, of going back and looking at, at who has received money and the process that we're into it. I am a huge fan fan of transparency and I think it's something that we owe the community you know with taxpayer dollars um, so uh, uh, I think any way that we could possibly you know find some middle ground there where it still feels reasonable and and we're being very transparent with people but we're also 
you know, not necessarily creating an undue burden. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a tricky one. Okay, Mary, if you want, do you have any comment or history? Well, about and, and John, this is Elizabeth. It just, it could be that there's a, a simple way of asking grantees to demonstrate how they've done due diligence. So it, it might not even need to be that they can demonstrate like three competitive bids or, or what, but there's just a simple way of asking them on their grant application how they would do due diligence or how they have already done their due diligence. How are they making, I, to me, that's what I thought Julia was sort of suggesting, some kind of approach that was that was clear, but not necessarily the full pol policy. So Mary, go ahead. Um, when this was signed and it passed in 2013, I was not on the select board at that time. I was the administrative assistant in the manager's office. And um, I took a look at some minutes, but I believe this was a joint, this is a joint um, agreement. And I know that at this point, there's probably only one, possibly two select board members who were there at that point. I also, maybe Jeff was a yeah, trustee at that time. Um, so, I would, I would look a little further now that we've talked about this tonight. I'm thinking perhaps there's something in minutes of a joint meeting that I might be able to look at. I didn't look at a joint meeting before. So um, I can try one more time to look and see what if and what the discussion was at that point. But I was not a select board member then. Jeff, do you, were you, I don't think you were out in the trustees then, were you? Wait, you're muted, Jeff. He was not. I was, uh, uh, I was in between different terms at that, on that particular date. But it seems to me, just, I'd just like to throw out that um, uh, the whole concept of uh, being part of the application process would make a whole lot of sense. The, the, what I've heard makes a lot of sense, uh, and and if the select board agrees, they should it, you know the application should say has due diligence been done or how do you intend to do deal, due diligence, and so that people are cognizant that uh, you're not that you are expecting them to uh, do some homework in whoever it is that they're they're hiring for whatever that purpose might be. That's just to me that's just common sense, and 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 uh, I, I'd recommend going in in that direction, but that I, I agree that the select board should make that call. Yeah, but with by the select board, I think Larry meant the select board and the trustees. I think it was, we sometimes <clears throat> often well, the, 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 yes, the, yeah, the, the trustees do sp do uh, supply, uh, go through that process also for things involving certain village properties. And, um, you know, so I would certainly recommend that the application be the place where you find this out for grantees. Okay. I, I think to the, to the, sorry, Mary, go ahead. You look like you want to. One, one more thing. Um, based on the conversation here tonight and the fact that the importance of maintaining transparency is so obvious and well stated, um, I'm, I'm sure that there's, you have the best intentions and you would convey that to your grantees as well. Okay, well, why don't we do this? And I, th I think to, to just go back to, to, to I, so we've gotten sort of a range of opinions. I mean, everyone, it's, it sounds like doing nothing is not supported. Uh, and so doing something, at least clarifying something and, and doing it is every, everyone, I think, agreed with that. Oh, I'm sorry, almost everybody. Um, the, the, um, to, to Larry's point about this, is, this should be a select board and trustees decision. I agree, but I feel like as a subsidiary board underneath them, our kind of good practice is to not present them with a question, but present them with an issue and a, rec and a range of solutions, and one of which we think is best, having thought it through, so that they can then change their mind and do something different, but that we've done the work on behalf of, of them to, to make it easier for them to make a decision. So it sounds like, that, that what everyone, many people were in favor of is doing some, a little bit more work, in particular talking to grantees and trying to figure out the mechanics 
of it so that we can avoid Michael's concern if it's possible to avoid it. And we'll discover that, um, you know, whether it's possible to avoid that and, uh, and create some kind of language probably on the application that would um, either ask, ask what due diligence has been done or will be done so that we can evaluate that as part of the grant process or more extreme perhaps i'm not personally in favor of it but more extreme would be that to require them to go through you know some similar process to the to the trustees so larry you want the last word and so so no decision made is just this will guide our our work in in uh you know over the next month probably over the next month and we'll bring this up again at the next meeting did you want to say something larry? Uh, no no i'm not used to having the last word <laughs> that mean, all right, then, then the second to last word. <laughs> no, I think that's, that's, that's a fine resolution. Oh, that's the last word. I tricked you. <laughs> uh, Sally, were you, did you want to say something? I, I couldn't tell you were coming on. But maybe. No, I'm fine. Okay. All right. Thank you for that direction. Uh, we'll we'll can sort of work on that and, and we'll uh, have a further discussion next month and hopefully we can sort of put that to bed. Um, Tesh, is Tesh still on? It looks like she might, have I missed her again? No, she's not. But maybe Elizabeth, you can mention to her um, that, uh, you know, this has to be approved by the select board. Uh, and Mary, when is the next select board meeting? Which... Uh, August 18th. Okay, uh, so uh, Elizabeth, can you find out and make sure that that's sort of not gonna be operationally a big problem for them? Um, if it yeah. is, I, I imagine the importance of this, we could get a quick select board meeting. I, I don't want to speak for them, but I would hope that we could. But August 18th, we'll, we will present this to the select board and they'll have a discussion about it. So I, th if, I think that that's fine, right? Um, there, there is some conditional approval anyways with the, with the licensure, so. Okay. Yeah. Would you also, do you mind if you just be the messenger and would you mention to Tesha the meeting on August 18th so that she can be available for the select board meeting in case they have questions? I don't, again, they've, you know, I think we've given it a good vetting here and Mary uh, was at the meeting. So I doubt that it will be needed, but it would be a shame to have to wait a month because. Yeah, no, exactly. I think, yeah, I think their big concern is having, just a minute, please, is having, um, is, is just having a little bit of, of cash on hand to pay the program director so she can start hiring staff. Okay. Well, I mean, I think she, you know, it's highly, highly likely that this will be approved because only not based on the substance of it, but only because the select board has approved almost everything that we've recommended. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Is there any other? And wait, John, can I, can you just clarify that if August 18th was going to just be a not, not work that there could be a special select board meeting. Well, I will request. It? I will request. You could request it. Leave it at that, and 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 I'll be the one to request it. So just get back to me and tell me, and I'll ask the select board. And the, you know, they, my my opinion of the select board is that they bend over backwards to try to accommodate things when it's important to do so. But I can't. I mean, well, the chair is just nodding and smiling, so that's a good sign. Yeah, <laughs> we'll sure try. We'll sure try. We don't want to. We don't want to push her beyond. It's, it's good enough that she's nodding and smiling. Thank you. Okay. I'm only other... one of. I'm only one of five. <laughs> any other any other items before we adjourn? No. Okay. Can we have a motion to adjourn? Move. Joe is moved. Is there a second? Michael seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, John. Stay healthy. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.